Barbara. Hello, Cody. Hello, Bay. Hi, Albert. Pops Mountain TV. So, today's episode is a little different. I'd like to tell you about a book. This book. As you know, I love books and my bookcase. But I want to talk to you today about the power of books and the power of this particular book. This book was written by a guy called Bruno Rossano. He's about the same age as me, born in 1954, a couple of years younger. And he wrote this book 20 years ago. And what I want to explain to you is how this book, which this chap wrote, has had a, made a big difference to the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. But hang on a second. Before we get on with this one, let's just finish off the last one. The last one was about ice forming, and I was delighted to get a couple of questions. I got a question from, um, I got a question actually from Fred from Coty, uh, and that question was, when does ice form? Really good question. Ice forms at night, mainly. If you looked at those videos that I collected off the internet, you could see that they were taken over 24 hours, because you could see it going dark and it goes bright during the daytime. And you'll notice that the ice forms at night. And that's why when it's light and you could see the river flowing, the ice wasn't forming. It was forming at night when it was dark. Obviously at night it does that because at night it's colder. It also does it because ice melts in sunlight. So it might be forming because it's cold, but then it's melting because of the sunlight. So answers the first question, ice forms at night. Second question uh, from Alex, this one. Uh, Alex was asking when he noticed at the end in the final piece of the video when we could see the drons forming a sheet of ice, the ice seemed to be forming around the twigs, the branches that were in the water. And he asked whether ice does form more around twigs. Well, the answer to that question is yes, it does. It forms where the river flows most slowly. So it does that at the edges, and you'll see that the ice forms on the edge of the river. It also does it around a branch or a rock or a twig. That's where the water is flowing at its slowest, and that's where the crystals, the ice crystals, have the best chance of forming. They're not being pushed away by the river. So that's our questions answered. And now let's get back to the story. Gareth, Dorian and myself going off to the Valley Myra on a ski de randonnée trip and how that links with the power of a book. First thing I'd like to do is to draw a map of Europe so I can show you where we went, where the Valley Myra is. of you who haven't guessed that's England that's the Lewis's house that's the Norris Rainscourt's house this is France that's the Eiffel Tower that's Lake Geneva and this is Morzine these are the Alps this is Italy that's Sicily this is Spain so we started off from here in the car and we drove through the Alps, past Turin, down towards Cuneo, and then we went up here, and the Valley Myra is there. And for the next stage in our story, I've asked an old friend of Pops Mountain TV, Uncle Jeff, to come along and to give us a little bit of the background, what was happening in the Valley Myra before Bruno wrote his book. At the end of the Second World War, if you'd have been in Chiapala and the Valley of Myra, you would have seen vibrant but poor communities, well populated, with families working on the, on the land and providing the services which people who work on the land need. There were schools, there were post office, there were bakers. In one village that we refer to specifically, there were seven bakers this time of year. The area was cut off from the rest of the world by weather and the lack of effective transport, very few cars were around. But it was a vibrant and busy community, 
albeit very poor. In the mid 50s onwards, things started to change. For a whole variety of reasons, younger people, including Luca the guy, you'll be meeting later on, left the villages and went to work in the car factories in Turin and other associated industries. As a result, you got a process of fairly rapid abandonment. Villages went from having many school, many um, shops to having no school, no post office, probably a crumbling church and just one baker. And that state of abandonment was pretty much the way the valley stayed right until up to about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Bruno wrote his book. And when Bruno wrote his book, things for changed for the valley. And this is the book. It's called uh, Karamayo Mai on Enval Maira. Uh, that, that actually is written in the local dialect and it means it's still snowing in Valmaira. 120 numbered ski routes. And over here it gives you the actual route and on the photographs which he's got you can see the route on the photograph marked with a red line and it just makes it so easy to follow. Normally ski routes, footpaths are shown on maps. That's okay, it's a map, but you have to be able to read the map. But these are shown on a photograph from above. He's taken this photograph from another mountain and he's used it to explain how to get from down here on this particular one, you follow the ridge, you follow the ridge all the way up to the top, and then you ski down on the other side there. Really, really easy to follow. People learned about the skiing in the valley. They came to the valley, they used the book, they explored the valley, they went back, they told their friends, they went back to Austria, to Germany, to Switzerland, to France, and slowly the number of people coming to the area grew. At that point, the, the, the town of Chiapara, the region, and in fact, European community, got together and decided to invest a lot of money in rebuilding all the old broken down houses, churches, schools, so that they could welcome the visitors from abroad. And uh, the place that I stayed with Gareth and Dorian was actually the old abandoned school from the 1950s and the 1960s, which with this money had been transformed into a beautiful refuge for holidaymakers. Visitors are coming from all over Europe to explore these mountains which have not been really explored before. To walk up or on the, um, whatever it is they do to get up and to ski down. And they'll be facing a world which does not have ski lifts, restaurants, loads of tourists, people flying in from Ryanair or whatever it is. They'll be facing mountains which are relatively untouched which they're able to enjoy in their full. And the, the disaster is, really, which I have to tell you, is that you will then get visitors like Steve, <laughs> Dorian and Gareth. Who can imagine anything worse? <laughs> Bolognese. Con? 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 Con?
Mergia, a Bolognese, Balcon... for example, Bolognese mm. is another word that we don't use so much in Italy. Oh, okay. We say ragù, that is a French ragù, word. Ragù, ragù, but for example, when I was asking, he said that there is this with the ragù. No. Not Bolognese, but Bolognese is, is used uh, everywhere the, in the world, yeah. right? but not so much in Italy. But if you go to Bolo Bologna, yes. you, can't, you, don't get, you don't eat this. No. They don't. They no, don't. no. Uh, small point if anybody ever wants to ask a question about any of my videos I'd be thrilled to have your answers and you can actually use the comment section uh, below the video video when you're looking at it on YouTube to type in uh, a comment or a question and I'll happily reply in that way or you can do like the Lewis's did and you can send me a, a whatsapp video and I can get your questions from there and answer them back in uh, the video <laughs>